Amen. First Corinthians chapter number 11, so we're going to be there for the entire sermon. This is going to be kind of a Bible study tonight, so I guess every sermon is kind of a Bible study because we're in the Bible, but uh, we're going to kind of go detailed uh, through um, the part of this chapter where Paul is talking about um, the Lord's Supper or coming together for the Lord's Supper, because we're going to be doing this here uh, in preparation for Easter. We celebrate the Lord's Supper every Wednesday before uh, the, Easter, the Easter Sunday um, coming up. I'm going to explain to you why we do that, um, but I'm going to first go through the detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and kind of show what the Lord's Supper is, what it's not, and why we do what we do here um, for the Lord's Supper. So, um, first of all, you know, what is, you know, I was raised, you know, Lutheran, which is basically Catholic, and Lutheranism and many Protestant religions teach very close to what the Catholics teach in this sense, is that the Lord's Supper, or Holy Communion, they call it, is a sacrament, all right? And uh, you say, what, what is a sacrament? Uh, a sacrament is a kind of a, I guess you could say, it's not a Bible word. It's a word that is basically, you know, sort of made up from a Latin word. And a sacrament, basically, if you look up the Catholic definition of a sacrament, I always have to write this down because it's so confusing, you know, but it says this. It says, sacraments are efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church through which divine life is given. So a sacrament is basically something in the Catholic Church, there's seven sacraments. In the Lutheran Church, there was two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's and, and Holy Communion were sacraments. In the Catholic Church, I don't even know if I can name all seven. It's like, it's like the Eucharist or Holy Communion, Confirmation, I think, is one. Uh, you got marriage is one. You got the anointing, I'm counting, anointing of the sick. Uh, I don't know what the other ones are. Uh, baptism is one. And then there's like holy orders, I think, is one. Did I hit seven? I think I got close, to, close enough, okay, since they're all fake anyway. All right. So sacraments are basically the way for the false Catholic Church, and then the Protestants kept it going out of the Catholic Church. The Protestants are very Catholic, you know, when it comes down to it. That was one of the shocking points of my life when I realized, oh, man, I'm Catholic. <laughs> you know, when, when, I, when I finally realized what the Bible said, and because I was raised in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, which was a very conservative Lutheran church. It was like the small Lutheran church. It was not liberal. And many of the pastors that I had in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, were very anti-Catholic. They're like, we are not Catholic. We will not fellowship with Catholics. And then imagine my surprise when I finally see the truth, see the gospel. I'm like, oh, man, I'm Catholic. This whole time I've been Catholic. So sacraments are this way of tying our works to salvation. All right? And this is why so many Baptists before, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the 300s going, you know, into the Dark Ages, why so many Baptists were killed by the Catholic Church just because they would not accept that baptism is part of salvation because that's what was being taught, is that baptism is actually part of salvation and Christians would not accept that, rightfully so. But that's what a sacrament is. It's tying our works to salvation. And we know that salvation is not of works, no matter how tricky you get with it, it's actually worse for the Protestants because Protestants will teach that the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, is actually, they'll say, oh yeah, it's, it, you're saved by grace through faith. That's what Protestants will tell you. This is why sometimes it's, it's many, many times easier to get a Catholic saved than a Protestant saved because you'll tell a Protestant, it's just, it's faith alone. They're like, yeah, I know. It's only through grace. Yeah, I know, not of works. But the sacrament is a means of grace. So the way you get God's grace is by doing these works. I mean, you're just like... But that's what they believe. All right? So look, it's, there is no sacrament. It's, it's a made-up thing to just, you know, come up with a works-based salvation. But I mean, it makes no sense because basically... In order to, I mean, what if you stop doing the sacrament? It, it doesn't make any sense. How long do I have to, how long do I, how many times a week do I have to do sacraments? How many times a month? How many times a year? What, I mean, every hour? What do I have to do here? 
There's nothing like that in the Bible. It's basically based on two lies. The first lie is that salvation is earned over time. You know, like you're getting, you're getting salvation as your life goes on. When we know that's not true from, you know, everything in the Bible, especially John 3.36. Why I, I, I think that's why I probably like John 3.36 so much. Because, you know, it says, you know, that word hath. You know, you have it. You have it. You currently possess it. He that believeth on the Son hath. Just like that. It's in a moment that you are saved. That you get eternal life. That you get everlasting life. Salvation is not earned over time. Once you trust on Jesus, you get it in a moment. So it's based on that lie that you're earning this salvation over time. And then it's just, you know, it's a tie to works-based salvation, basically is what it is. All right. So look, it is not a sacrament. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 2, the Bible explains what it is. Look at verse number 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So what is it? What is it? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse number 2, it says, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye, talking to the church, remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So he's saying keep the ordinances. What are the ordinances? An ordinance is just an order. It's just something that you're commanded to do. That's all an ordinance is. Now, a Bible-believing Christian, a bible a fundamentalist who believes the words of the Bible believes that there's two ordinances of the church, and those ordinances are baptism and the Lord's Supper, things that we are commanded to do, all right? Don't go down to verse number 23, and let's get into the Lord's Supper and what it is all about and, you know, what it needs to, how it needs to be done and how we need to look at it. All right, look at verse number 23. First Corinthians chapter 11, this is also in the Gospels, Mark 14, I believe, and Matthew 26, the verse of the week, um, explain, you know, Jesus's words here. These are words that Jesus said at the Last Supper when he commanded the, the disciples to do this, where he gave this ordinance, but, but Paul repeats it um, with much more explanation of why we do it, how to do it, and how not to do it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is why we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tonight. And don't think that, oh, that's Paul. Look, Paul was taught by Jesus Christ himself. Paul knows, you know, exactly what Jesus Christ wants us to do and doesn't want us to do. All right, look at verse number 23. And let's get into this this evening. For I have received of the Lord that which was also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he, be he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So, I mean, this is not complicated. This is not complicated. And it is so crazy when I look at my life from the perspective of what I was taught about the Lord's Supper and the Eucharist and all this stuff that, that the, see, the difference between the Lutherans, the Protestants, and the Catholics is the Catholics believe that it is actually Jesus' body and blood that they are eating when they eat the bread and drink the wine. And they drink actual alcoholic wine, which is another sermon in itself. All right, but, and I've preached on that, I'm not even going to get into that point. The Lutherans believe that it's present in the bread and the wine, that the body and blood of Christ is present like spiritually or something. I don't even know what that means, okay? Why do we do it, though? Why do we do it? I mean, look, it is not Jesus' actual body and actual blood, first of all, and I'm not even going to get into that. I've preached on that extensively. If you believe that, it, it's foolish, and I don't even know where to begin. You know, Jesus, I mean, explained this so many times to the, it was the Pharisees that couldn't understand this type of thinking. You know, I am the bread of life. What? He's, he's a loaf of bread? What? I mean, that's not what we're talking about tonight. But why do we do it? Why, why is Jesus saying to, for the disciples to do this? Or at least, look, he's just saying at the time of the Last Supper right now. Okay, so we don't even know if he's telling us to continue doing it. All right, but look, he says, do this right now. Why? To remember me is what he's saying. Look at verse number 25. After the same manner, he also he took the cup, and after he had stopped saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So here he's saying, as oft as ye drink it. So this is implying that, you know, they should do this, you know, more often than just this one time. Why? 
Again, he says it again, to remember Jesus, to remember his sacrifice. Look at verse number 26 to kind of wrap it all together right now. He says, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. What does that mean? Till he come. That means till he comes back. So it means that the church is supposed to do this until they're raptured off of this earth. That's what this means. So he's saying, you do show, ye, the church, talking to the Corinthian church here, or talking to believers, you do show the Lord's death. What does that mean, to show the Lord's death? To remember. Again, he's saying, do this to remember me until I come back. This is why we say this is an ordinance of the church. It is an order of the church to do this. He's like, just keep doing this until he comes back. So you say, why don't we do this every Sunday? We'll get to that. Okay, but we see that we're supposed to do this. We are supposed to do this. Why? To remember Jesus, to remember his broken body, and to remember his blood that was shed, you know, for, you know, for the remission of sins, to remember those things, to bring those back. I mean, doesn't that make perfect sense? Because what do we do as Christians? What do we do as human beings. We take things for granted. We forget things. We get involved in our lives and we take everything for granted, our eternal life for granted, our eternal security for granted. We get involved in every, all the blessings that God has given us and we do what? We forget things. So Jesus is saying, I'm implementing this so you don't forget what I did. Amen. All right. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Just flip back a first uh, a few chapters in first Corinthians chapter number five let me explain to you why we do it once a year okay why we don't do it every week or why we don't do it once every other week or whatever I used to actually I used to actually gauge how conservative I thought whatever Lutheran church I was in on how often they did communion so I was really against a church that only did communion like once a month. I'm like, that's a liberal church right there. <laughs> but I'm going to show you why we just do it once a year. Look down at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse number 7. There's a very specific reason why we do it once a year. The Bible says this. It says, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Notice what the Bible says there. It says Christ, our Passover, meaning Christ, it doesn't say Christ during the Passover or Christ, you know, at the Passover. It says Christ, our Passover. The Passover was, in the Old Testament, the Passover was the actual lamb, all right? It pictured Christ, but the Bible here is saying that Christ is our Passover. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 8, Hebrews chapter number 8. And look at verse number 8. Jesus Christ is the actual replacement of the Passover lamb. It is what the Passover lamb was picturing. All right, look at Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 8. The Bible says, Finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. This is Romans 2.15 right here. And they shall, not teach, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that day, he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. This is why we call it the New Testament and the Old Testament. Right here. And now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So all that to say this. Every ritual and sacrifice in the Old Testament was a picture of Christ. All of these things that were done in the Old Testament, that was the Old Covenant, but it all pictured Christ. Go to Numbers chapter 9 and look at verse 
number 14. This is also why. So we see Christ is the Passover. Christ is the Passover, the Passover lamb that somebody in the Old Testament would have called the Passover. When they said kill the Passover, they meant kill the, the unblemished lamb. That was just picturing the real Passover, which was Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, this is also interesting. Look at Numbers, actually go to Numbers chapter 9 and look at verse number 14. Because it's very interesting to see when a stranger would come into the land, somebody that wasn't um, an Israelite. This is, just goes to show you that it was never about genealogies, by the way. Because somebody could come in, even in the Old Testament, somebody could come into the nation of Israel and they could accept the one true God. They could essentially get saved, which is what I'm going to show you actually happened to that person. And as soon as that happened, they got saved. They accepted the one true God. They were treated exactly like the people that were born in the nation of Israel, who had parents from the nation of Israel and all that. It's never been about genealogies. Right. The only time the genealogies were actually important was when God was just dividing up the land, saying, all right, these people get this spot over here and these people get this spot over here. That's, that's the only reason it was really important because even strangers could come into the land. Ruth was a Moabitess. They could come into the land and it was all about what they believed. Yeah. It was all about the, where they put their faith. But look at Numbers chapter 9 and verse number 14. I'll prove it to you. And if a stranger shall sojourn among you, mean, meaning a stranger comes into the nation and hangs out among you. And look at, look at what the criteria is here. And what? And will keep the Passover unto the Lord according to the what? What is it? The sacrament of the Passover. It's, it's an ordinance. And keep the ordinance of the Passover, and according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. Ye shall have one ordinance, both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land. So what did he have to do? What did this stranger that came from Egypt or wherever have to do in order to be treated with all the same laws? There was no, he was under, you know, uh, tribute or anything like that. As soon as he did what? He kept the Passover. What does that mean? That is implying that he knew about the coming Messiah that the Lord was going to send. Yep. And they were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the promise of the coming Messiah just as we are saved by trusting and looking backwards at the Messiah that has already come. The pa that's why Numbers 9.14, that's why the stranger is like, oh, they just, it's not about just, oh he, oh, he did it, he celebrated and he ate the meal and whatever. No, he believed. Yeah. He believed. He believed in the coming Messiah. It's talking about he was saved. They were saved. And they're to be treated exactly as everyone else. The Passover equals the Messiah. The Passover is to the Old Testament. The Passover is to the Old Testament as the Lord's Supper is to us, is what this boils down to. The Old Testament, again, the Old Testament is just a picture of the coming Messiah versus a remembrance of the one that has already come for us. It, isn't, that, isn't that, I mean, isn't that just amazing how well that fits together? How well that, that they, they were just doing this, they were doing this meal picture Jesus coming, and what are we going to do? We're going to do this meal to remember that Jesus came. It, it's, it's poetic. It's so perfect. And that's why we do it once a year. That's why we don't do it every week. Because it's replacing the Passover. Very simple. Now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. It's not that complicated if you just read the Bible. It fits together perfectly. It makes perfect sense. So obviously, who's to do it? Believers are to do it. People that are, just as Numbers chapter 9, verse 14, you know, it's people that believe in the Messiah, people that have trusted on Jesus is to do the Lord's Supper to remember Jesus. It wouldn't make much sense to, to want to celebrate something to remember Jesus if you didn't believe in Jesus in the first place. But how is it administered and received? What's going on here in the Corinthian church? Because Paul has some pretty strong words for what's happening here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 16. The, the Corinthian church is whatever they're doing, they're not doing it right. 
and Paul is rebuking them harshly, what's going on here in the Corinthian church is the Lord's Supper is not for eating and drinking. All right, look at verse number 16. Look at verse number 16. There was problems here with the Lord's Supper. And in verse number 16, the Bible says, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. So here we see that Paul is saying, he says two things that are pretty, pretty amazing here. He says, number one, there's, there's contentious people in the church. What does that mean? It means a person given to disagreeing, a person given to arguing, you know, somebody who's just like, this is, a, this is what pastors would call a troublemaker. Somebody that just is constantly just going against other people, constantly just going against what the pastor wants to do, just contentious, all right, just causing trouble. And then look what he says in verse number 17, though. He says there's contentious things going on here. There's contentious people, but he says it would be better that you come together. He says you come together not for the better, but for the worse. You know what he's saying? It would be better that you not come together than to come together like this. Isn't that a profound thing to say? He's saying it would literally be better if you, I mean, look, you know what he's saying? If a, content, if a person is contentious, it would be better to, I mean, just overall, if a person was contentious and just wanted to cause trouble, and just wanted to argue with people, wanted to cause all kinds of problems, it would be better that they didn't go to church. Isn't that a profound thing? I mean, I stand up here and scream at you all the time like you need to be in church. You need to be coming to church. The Bible commands it. But if you're contentious and you want to cause problems, it'd be better that you didn't come to church. I'm going to explain to you why that is. But that's what he's saying. Look at verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. For there, almost, there, there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So we, we got all kinds of problems going on here. But then he gets more specific on what's actually happening. He says, when ye, again, ye, he's talking to the whole church here. He's talking to a plural group of people, talking to the Corinthian church. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So he's saying, you're not eating the Lord's Supper. It's like, you're coming together as a church. You say you're coming together to eat the Lord's Supper, but that's not what's happening here, is what Paul is saying. For in eating, Why? Now he's going to explain it. For means here's why. Here's why you're not, do, you know, you're not doing the Lord's Supper. He says, For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. So everyone is going, and they are just using the Lord's Supper to just, some people are just going, and they are just gorging on food and drink, and then some people just get nothing. And Paul is saying, this is not the Lord's Supper. This is not what is supposed, supposed to happen. Look at verse uh, number 22. He says what? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or ye despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So specifically, this was like this potluck where he had a bunch of people bringing like this great food and then other people couldn't bring much or anything and like the people that didn't bring anything got nothing and the people that brought the great food just ate way too much and didn't allow anybody else to eat their stuff. I mean right now some of you are thinking like I'm glad it doesn't work this way in this church. No, I'm just kidding. But just think about that for a second. There is always going to be, and Paul, he's, he's kind of, a, he's, a, he's an evangelical leader of this group. He's rebuking these people. But it's interesting because, first of all, they're using the Lord's Supper to gorge themselves on food. And he's saying, that's what eating at your house is for. It's not to actually get sustenance and to eat and drink. It's, it's, not, it's not a potluck, period, aside from the divisions part of it. But then some went without. And there's the, there's the divisiveness about it. And look, it was, you know, you have to understand that I can relate to what Paul is saying here because, like, he's seeing something that only the leader of the church sees. He's seeing something in every single church, every single, and this was actually much of what Paul preached on when he wrote the epistles to the churches. 
he was constantly preaching on getting the church together, getting the divisions out of the church, getting all these people, that, especially the Gentiles. I mean, are you kidding me? The Gentiles are coming to church now. They're nothing like the Jews. Even Peter had a problem with this. Even Peter had a problem sitting down and eating the things that the Gentiles wanted to eat. And God had to teach him a lesson about that. But Paul is constantly just preaching against this, constantly trying to get these cultures broken down, get everybody just accept this one culture of the Bible. And look, I mean, it's something that a pastor has to think about. Maybe you don't see it, but it's one of the reasons that a lot of things are done the way they're done around here is because the pastor sees everybody. So the pastor just can't have, like, two people in the church get to do something and then other people don't because it will cause divisions and contentions and things that will cause problems. So it's Paul looking out for everyone in the church because he has that perch. He sees that view. He doesn't want these divisions to be happening. And I'm sure that caused many contentions. But what Paul, back to verse 17, he's basically saying that it would be better that you did nothing. It would be better that you did nothing, you didn't even attempt to have the Lord's Supper, than doing what you're doing now. It's like, this is a mess. This is a train wreck. This thing that you're doing. Look down at verse number 23. Verse number 23. So again, what, what are they doing? Some are going without. Some are getting too much. And they're treating it like a meal. They're treating it like a meal. And then some are getting some and some are not. Okay? Look at verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. I'm going to read this again. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, now look at this. He says, Whosoever, and this is why it would be better off if they did nothing than do, doing it the way they were doing it. And this is why I preach a sermon like this tonight before we go into Wednesday. It says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That sounds pretty serious right there. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Like, damnation? What in the world? You lose my salvation over what's going on? I'm not coming to church Wednesday night. It's talking about, I'm going to prove to you that damnation here is talking about just punishment. It's talking about punishment. In a couple verses down, he explains very clearly that our punishment as saved believers is much different than the punishment that the world will receive. Okay, and he's very clear about that. Let's keep reading. Look at verse number 30. He kind of starts explaining it right now. Now look at this. He says, for this cause, what was this cause? That they were doing this wrong. That they had all these contentions, that there was all these divisions, that they were doing the Lord's Supper wrong. They were just using it as a big party to just, you know, a bunch of people, you know, having just gorging on food and drink, other people getting nothing. It says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. And look at this. And many sleep. You know what he's saying? Like, people have died. He's saying that people have literally been chastised to the point. Look, did you know that, that God's chastisement can take your physical life? Not trying to wreck your day, but, and look, you're not going to accidentally stumble into something that's gonna, where God's going to take your life, okay? But, like, people that are coming into, hey, look, peop, let me just tell you something. Judgment on people that come into a church to cause division and contention is serious. I'm shocked how serious it is. I can read this in the Bible just as you can read this in the Bible, but let me tell you something. It's true. It's true. And I'll, I'll just leave it there, and I do not rejoice in the, I, I do not rejoice in the downfall of, of mine enemies, as the Bible says. But God's judgment is God's judgment. 
and I do not tell God what to do in cases like that. But Paul is giving a pretty strict warning here. He's saying, look, the reason you guys have so many contentions, you're doing all these things wrong, is the reason that you're having all this, these health problems and people are dying in the church. Now, that's a pretty harsh letter. What he's saying is contention in the church and causing contention in the church is a major sin, is what Paul is explaining here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. Now he's going to tell them like, how to fix it, like how to like, not have this happen anymore. Look what he says, verse 31, he says, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. He's like, hey, police yourself. Like, stop doing this. Police yourself, catch yourself, and then God doesn't have to step in and do these things. I mean, look, that's a general rule of thumb for a Christian right there. Police yourself, or God is going to do it for you. Look at verse 32. Now he explains, you know, what verse, if you just kind of draw a line between verse 32 and verse 29, he explains here, he says, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. And look, that can be bad, as he just explained in verse number uh, what was that? Verse number 30, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be, what? Condemned with the world. So he's saying, like, when we're chastised, we're going to be chastened of the Lord, but we're not going to be condemned with the world. He's saying you're not going to lose your salvation. He's like, but God's chastisement is real. I mean, if, if you die and go to, if God takes you to heaven, if God looks down at you as a Christian and he gets to the point where he's just like, uh, yeah, I'm just going to take this guy to heaven right now. That's not good. I mean, you're still going to go to heaven, but that's not a place where I want to be with God ever. But he is still very clear to say that condemned with the world, that condemned with the world means hell. It means, you know, true spiritual damnation. This is the difference in verse number 32. That's the difference between the saved and the unsaved right there. All right? We won't go to hell. But we'll be chastened of the Lord in this life. Sick, dying. I mean, severe. Something that we should take very seriously. Look at verse number 33. So what's the answer? What's the answer? Look at verse number 33. The Bible says, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together. So he's like, hey, you know, you should do this. So we're going to come together on Wednesday night. What does he say? He says, tarry for one, tarry one for another. What does that mean? It means like, look, we do this even not with the Lord's Supper. So we do this, we tarry for one for another in a very specific way in this church. And I don't know if other churches do it this way. Many of the churches I grew up in, and, and I, I know Verity Baptist Church did it this way, but we tarry, what does that mean? We wait. We wait. So what do we do here? We, the, the men wait, the men tarry for the women and the children to eat first. Just in a potluck, not at the Lord's Supper. We don't, you know, bust into line and just try to get the food first. Like, I'm the pastor. Give me the hamburger first. You know, I could do that, you know. <laughs> but we tarry one for another. And by the way, just like, just for the record, like, it's really annoying, like, if people don't tarry for one another. That irritates me. Because you should follow the program of the church and tarry one for another. And I, I believe, just like as a servant leader, I believe it's Christian that the women and the children should always eat first. And when the last of the women and children have eaten, that's when the first of the men can start to eat. But we tarry one for another. So, same thing at the Lord's Supper. We're not just going to be like, you know, we're going to wait. When we do the Lord's Supper, the, the ushers are going to pass out the bread, and we're all going to wait. We're not going to be like, ah, but we're going to wait and we're all going to eat together, right? And then same thing when we pass out the wine, the non-alcoholic wine, we are going to wait for one another and then we will all partake together, all right? So look, what does this mean for us? Look at verse number 34. It says, if any man may hunger, let him eat at home. So again, don't like go on a you know 50 hour fast or whatever and then come to church on on Wednesday night and expect us to just like feed you and don't come up after the service and be like where's the rest of the bread I'm hungry I'm joking but I mean it's not for eating it's not for getting filled up and getting it's not for eating and drinking if any man hunger let him eat at home 
that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. What does this mean? What does this mean for us? How can we be sure that we partake of the Lord's Supper properly as Christians? What it means for us is that the Lord's Supper is for us personally to remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, not to eat and drink to fill ourselves up. And the second thing is, as Paul says, we need to examine ourselves. You need to come to the Lord's Supper with a clean conscience, particularly towards your brothers and sisters in the church. So there shouldn't be, you shouldn't come to the Lord's Supper with contentions between your brothers and sisters. If you have contentions, if you have any, you know, problems with anybody in the church, you, I mean, here's, from this morning, let it go. That's the first thing to do. But you can also confess things. You can also get things right. You can also, you know, just before Wednesday, though. Or, you know, don't do it. Is what Paul is saying. You're in danger of chastisement, of varying degrees, as the Bible is saying here. This is not difficult to understand here. It's an ordinance. It's an order. It's a command. Paul just doesn't want, he's just talking about the divisions that were going on in the Corinthians church. It is something that we should do. It is something that is good to do. It is a good picture and to remember our Passover as we look back on Christ. He's just saying, don't do it in these ways. And we would never do it in these ways. I mean, this, you think about this situation in this church, it's completely out of control as you, you see this. And, you know, you had the haves and the have-nots, which should never be. You know, the thing about a church is this. You're always going to have people that have more money than other people in the church. But none of those things should affect how the church does things and who has things in the church and who doesn't have things in the church. It's not like, I've literally had people tell me that I give a lot of money to this church. I've had people say that to me. I mean, that's a, that's a real thing. And people think, I mean, so, but that's kind of a proof that some people are kind of obsessed over that type of thing, that, you know, they're going to get more say, or they're going to get a favorable opinion from the pastor because, you know, I go through all the, the, the tithing statements, be like, oh, this guy, I better make sure I talk to him longer than this guy, or whatever. I mean, but people, it's, it's ridiculous, and you're laughing, but people think this way. People think this way. And that's what was happening here. And we don't ever want stuff like that going on here. You should never, if you think that way, like, shame on you. <laughs> Nobody here thinks that way. But, I mean, it happens, is, is all I'm saying. These crazy things happen. Contentions in the church. People that literally just come into the church and, and just, like, they get to the point. Maybe they didn't come in like that, but they get to the point where they're just, like, that's all they're about is contention and trouble. And you're just like, what? It happens. It's real, and it's serious. God takes it very seriously. Thank God we don't have any of those problems now, but I just want you to see how serious these things are, and I want you to see why we do the Lord's Supper so we can all do it correctly. So look, confess your sins to the Lord. Get things right. If you got something, you know, you offended somebody and you're feeling bad, go tell them. I mean, tell them. Get things right. If somebody said something to you that offended you. You can't let it go. Go talk to them about it, or, you know, it's easier just to let it go. It's like, that's, you, can, you, you can unanimously do that just yourself, right? Just don't be offended, and have no divisions, and everything's going to be great. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.